frankly, I'm bored with the constant comparisons between the Odyssey and the Mini Moog, and I'm sure it must have driven ARP absolutely nuts back in the day. But the one common comment that comes up time and time again is that the Mini Moog is fat and the Odyssey is thin. The truth is though that the Mini with its 3D tuned oscillators couldn't fail to be fat, whereas perhaps the Odyssey with two needed a little more work. Now one way that people fattened up the sound was to use pulse width modulation. And to start this off, you'll need to make sure that both oscillators are set to square wave. Then, head up to the LFO section and make sure there's a reasonable speed set for the single LFO. At this point, this is only a guide though, and we'll be able to fine tune it later, so don't get too anal right now. One thing I do want to do though, is to make sure that LFO keyboard retriggering is turned off. So that this will give us a constantly cycling LFO which doesn't get restarted by each note on. Next, we head to the oscillator section, and specifically to the pulse width section. Now it's here where we can define the width of our square wave, and also apply modulation at the rate determined by the LFO. Now I find it's best to deal with each oscillator individually, so the first thing I'm going to do is turn oscillator 2 down and focus on oscillator 1. With only this oscillator sounding, we can start to get busy. Simply select a degree of modulation and you'll hear the oscillator waveform start to modulate immediately. From here, we can go back to our LFO and just tweak the rate so it's comfortable. And then we'll start adjusting the modulation depth and pulse width so that we end up with a nice deep pulsating sound. Now even with this single oscillator, it's possible to get a really rich bass sounds. And one trick I'll use time and time again is to reinforce this with the ring modulator. Not too much though, or things will get too messy. Anyway, let's strip that out for the moment and head to oscillator 2 and give it some level. Now it's your choice as to whether you want to use this to reinforce the oscillator 1 sound with a sawtooth on oscillator 2. And that will work well and in some cases it can be better than introducing another pulse width modulation. However, for the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to go for the latter, but I'm going to make sure that it has a slightly different pulse width to that of oscillator 1. Generally, what I'll tend to do is try and keep this second oscillator more square, but that's just personal choice. You could just as easily choose a narrow pulse width and use this sharper sound to reinforce the fatter one of oscillator 1. But no matter what you do, I find the trick here is not to use too much modulation and not to make it too overbearing. Oh, and here's a tip for getting subtle adjustments out of the oddity sliders. Just move them horizontally as opposed to vertically. Now you can, if you want, choose to introduce some pitch modulation on one or both oscillators. But again, the trick is to keep this subtle, almost indiscernible. Then it's a case of balancing filter tracking, or removing it altogether. Now personally, I like to have a little bit more bite in the upper part of the keyboard, but it's all subjective. However, the trick I find here is to work closely with the filter cutoff and the filter envelope depth sliders. That way you can really shape the overall sound to fit with what you're after. 